On to the second half of Unit 5, The Art of the Pacific. This podcast will be less long-winded, partly because many of the themes are the same and partly because I want you to have time to work on your presentations. I'm not repeating these, these presentation instructions. You know the drill. I'll open with the same comment that I made about Africa. We are talking about a huge area and a great disparity in cultures. In the case of Oceania, however, there is certainly at least one uniting theme. These are people whose lives were dominated by the ocean. Anthropologists usually divide the region into four groupings, which you can see here. Australia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. Note that New Zealand really belongs in Polynesia. Its native Maori people emigrated to the island from Polynesia. Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, and Hawaii are also considered part of Polynesia. Easter Island is just too far east to appear on the map. You should recognize the two, these two works from our prehistoric art unit. Both are from Melanesia, the Ambum Stone from Papua New Guinea and the geometrically carved Lapida Terracotta fragment from the Solomon Islands. Do you remember who the Lapida people were and why they're important to Oceanic history? They're believed to have migrated from Southeast Asia, bringing some of their Neolithic technology, plants, and animals with them, and are the ancestors of modern-day Micronesians, Polynesians, and some of the people of the Melanesian coastal areas. As the map made pretty clear, this is a geographic area dominated by the ocean. The skill to navigate oceans, to use ocean resources, and to understand ocean weather is central to surviving and thriving in this region. Indeed, many of the voyages of Polynesian sailors are as technologically impressive and personally courageous as any of the voyages of European explorers. The Pacific, after all, is really bigger and scarier than the Atlantic. I suspect that the centrality of the ocean to Pacific art, and in fact it's often called oceanic art, is a reason why the College Board included this navigation art in its list of required works. You'll learn what the sticks and shells stand for, and that this chart wasn't actually taken to sea, where presumably it was too fragile to survive. Instead, it was memorized on land. Yes, I am recycling one of my Africa slides here, and I'll do it again. But the point carries through to Pacific art. Here we see a female deity from Micronesia and an example of a temple or cult house where offerings would be brought to the image during the harvest. For the period of these rituals, the sculptures were considered the resting place of a god or a deified ancestor's spirit. This is a modern day cult house, by the way, and I confess I couldn't find an image of one from this particular culture. Similarly, the Ahuula or feather cape was far more than a decoration. These were symbols of the highest rank and could be worn only by members of the chiefly class. Chiefs wore them during ceremonies, but they also wore them into battle, as this 19th century illustration shows. No two capes have the same design, since they tell a very specific story about each chief's lineage and accomplishments. The colors are symbolic. Red in particular is the color of kings, much as purple became associated with kingship in Europe. Yellow was valuable because yellow feathers were especially scarce. So why wear such a precious and presumably somewhat delicate and vulnerable work of art into battle? Well, these capes were thought to provide the chief with divine protection against an enemy's weapons. And given the extraordinary dense and intricate weaving, it's possible that they did. Think of chain mail. They were also intended to scare off enemies. Polynesian society, in particular, was hierarchical and socially stratified, with a powerful ruling aristocratic class. It's sometimes described using the term feudal. Polynesian rulers sought to protect and enhance their mana. It's a complicated concept, and I doubt that I understand it completely. But essentially, mana is a kind of spiritual force emanating from the gods, associated with the possession of power, effectiveness, and high standing in the community. The term, in other words, captures a combination of efficacy, ability to get things done, and prestige, social status. Keeping, gaining, or losing mana was very important to the leaders in these communities. The European portrait of a Maori leader and the tattoos on his face capture this individual's abundant mana. The word may originally have derived from words for thunder and reflects the straight, strong relationship between oceanic deities and the forces of nature that ruled the lives of people. 
I've mentioned that feathers had spiritual power in Hawaiian culture. On the left, you see a book mask from the Torres Strait. For this culture, animals had totemic powers. That is, they stood for certain spiritual forces. The image on the right, which is not a required work, shows a mask shaped like a crocodile surmounted by a human face. We've seen these human-animal combinations before. Think of the Lama Sioux. What message are they usually sending? These masks were used in rituals where masked dancers would reenact episodes from the lives of ancestral heroes, legendary beings whose actions helped establish these societies. The dancers evoked the powers of the animals portrayed, the flight of the birds, the fierce bite of the crocodile. I couldn't find any photos of book mask performance, and I believe that most of what we know about this comes from early European visitors to the island, who may have not been an entirely reliable source of information. The art of New Ireland traditionally centered on mortuary ceremonies and feasts to honor the dead. In northern New Ireland, the name given to these elaborate ceremonies is Malagan, which is also the term used for the carved and painted sculptures associated with funerary and coming-of-age rituals. The purpose of a Malagan funeral ceremony is to send the souls of the deceased to the realm of the dead. We've seen that in art before. At the climax of the ceremony, the commissioned Mulligan sculptures are exhibited in temporary display houses. Each sculpture honors a specific individual and illustrates his or her relationship with ancestors, clan totems, and or living family members. It's intended to be a representation of an individual's soul or life force, not, again, a direct portrait. During the course of the ceremony, the Mulligan are treated with the utmost care, since it's believed that the souls of the deceased actually enter the sculptures. Once the souls leave the Mulligan and the world of the living, the sculptures are no longer needed and are usually either burned or allowed to rot. Only the masks and musical instruments used during Mulligan ceremonies are preserved for future use. Can you think of other works we've studied that temporarily or permanently house a god or the spirit of the deceased? Think of statues portraying Egyptian pharaohs or the Hindu statue of Shiva, Lord of the Dance. These may be the most iconic ancestor statues in all of art history, although, as I hope our presenters will explain, there is still a lot of debate about what they really mean. Power and authority were very important in Pacific culture, as they are really in almost all cultures, especially in the more hierarchical and aristocratic cultures of Polynesia. The wearers of the feather capes actually recited the wearer's genealogy to increase the power or mana of a cape. Again, these capes were worn during ceremonies, but they were also worn into battle. The rather poignant portrait on the right, by the way, was a Hawaiian princess dressed in a feather cape for the funeral of her parents who had died on a trip to London. Only Hawaiian chiefs could wear the sacred feather cape. The patterns on the cape were created to reflect the intended wearer's lineage and included symbols relating to his clan. They're a little bit like heraldic sheets in Europe, shields in Europe. Traditionally, feather cape creators recited the genealogy of the wearer during construction of the cape. Sorry, I think I already mentioned that. Weaving the story of the family and the individual into the patterns of the garment. There's still a lot of mystery and uncertainty surrounding the ancient site of Nan Maidol in Pohnpei, Micronesia, but it seems to have been an elite center where the nobility resided and mortuary activities were presided over by the priests. It's thought that Nan Maidol served in part as a way for the ruling Sandalore chiefs to organize and control potential rivals by requiring them to live in the city rather than our, their home districts, where their activities were difficult to monitor. Stay tuned for the Palace of Versailles, a comparison that the College Board might well draw. I've already showed you the Maori chief with his very impressive tattoos, marks that would have sent clear, readily interpreted signals about his status and his mana to the people of the Maori culture. By the way, by the time this was painted, he was a leader in New Zealand's Methodist Church. Body art actually plays a central role in both African and Pacific culture. In the middle, you see a Samoan hand tattoo. The woman on the right was from the Kuba tribe of the Congo Basin, the tribe that produced the Ndote portrait. In Africa, body art more commonly took the form of scarification, which is also true of Maori tattoos, which are gouged into the skin. So why would body art be so important in these two regions? One answer is pretty simple. These are warm climates, so people do not wear a lot of clothes. 
Body art served the same function as beautiful textiles in northern climates, though these cultures produced beautiful textiles as well. I'm actually a little peeved that no African textiles were included on the list of required works, since I found much of this cloth, usually produced by women, exquisite. I've stuck an example of Ghanaian kenti cloth on the bottom of the slide just to whet your appetite to learn more. We'll see more of this in our Global Contemporary Unit, Unit 13. Again, this art is produced almost entirely by women. In these cultures, like African cultures, men generally carved and women wove, but we get to see the weaving this time around. What's especially fascinating about the staff god is how it combines male and female elements. And you'll notice there are a lot of College Board questions about that. The wooden core made by male carvers has a large head at one end and originally ended in a large penis representing male virility and fertility. Think of the Fang reliquary figure. The missionaries made the islanders cut the penises off these gods, ouch. But some scholars believe that other figures facing outwards could depict women in childbirth. The bark cloth made by women not only protects the ancestral power or mana of the deity, but it contains within the contains it within its different layers, so it has spiritual significance. This photographic image of a 1953 ceremony honoring Queen Elizabeth II captures the role of women both as creators and as performers of Pacific art. I've already talked about Mulligan funeral rituals, but in fact this Mulligan display also relates to the culture's coming of age rituals. After several months of training and seclusion, remember the Sunday societies of the Mende peoples? Young men and women are presented in public and given these carved and painted figures. The invitation ceremonies that follow include the creation of these special houses to hold the images. I notice that the dispor disproportionate number of the College Board sample questions on Pacific art seem to involve materials, probably because islanders were so dependent on native materials to create art. The stone logs of the Nan Maydal complex are actually naturally produced columnar basalt, not work stone. These columns form when flowing lava spreads several feet over a large area. The lava cools from top down as it loses heat to the atmosphere and from the bottom up as it loses heat to the ground below. The result is a pattern of fractures or cracks that form natural log-like shapes. The people of Nam Maydal use these columns in the same way that many mainland cultures have used logs for building. The basalt columns were much heavier, that's the downside, but also survived centuries later as an indicator of the industry and sophistication of the people who built these islands, islands cultures. Archaeologists are still debating how the people of this artificial island managed to move these huge stones over water. These works, however, are really mostly exceptions. Stone is not as uncommon in Pacific art as it is in African art, but we still see more art constructed of wood, feather, sea materials, and fiber, readily available local material. Bark cloth weaving, too, is a female art. I'm going to leave it up to the presenters to describe the complex way in which these works were created. Note the procession of women bringing in cloth of, a gift of cloth to the queen. Does this remind you of any other procession depicted in this course? Another procession involving a gift of cloth? Think the Panathenaic procession on the Parthenon frieze. Feather cloaks and capes were symbols of power and social standing in Hawaiian culture. I've talked about that quite a bit. Only high-ranking chiefs or warriors of great ability were entitled to wear these exceptional garments. Both the feathers and the color red, again, were associated with gods. The cape symbolized the king's religious responsibilities and conveyed his divinity. Note all the natural elements make up the book mask, including feathers and turtle shell. Stay tuned for Paul Gauguin, another painter who lived in the South Pacific in his later years. He took great inspiration from Pacific culture, and in exchange, he infected a large number of local girls with the syphilis that eventually killed him. Cultural exchange was not necessarily any kinder to the people of the Pacific than it was to the people of Africa. Remember our canned corned beef bowl? And that finishes up my introduction. Once again, good luck with your presentation.